Fight fans, welcome to the PBC Podcast, brought to you by Premier Boxing Champions with your host, Kenneth Buhari and Michael Rosenthal. Welcome, everyone, to the PBC Podcast. I'm Kenneth Buhari. And I'm Michael Rosenthal, editor of USA Today's Boxing Junkie. Thank you all for tuning in. This week, interim WBC middleweight champion Carlos Adamas will be joining us. And on Toe to Toe, Mike and I will take a look at the 2023 International Boxing Hall of Fame inductees. But let's jump right into our first interview. He takes on the undefeated Sam Goodman Saturday, June 17th, in a battle for the interim IBF 122-pound championship live on Showtime, the unbeaten Raiz Alim. Uh, Raiz, first things first, how has camp been thus far ahead of June 17th? Camp's been good. Uh, no complaints, you know, no, uh, n- nothing major. But uh, camp's been good, you know, uh, just ready for action. When, uh, when do you plan to fly out to Australia? Uh, leaving tomorrow. Okay. Yeah, uh, leaving tomorrow. Got a long flight. Got to try to get acclimated to uh, the time difference and everything the best I can. So this is your first fight outside the U.S. I mean, any concerns at all, or is this just part of the game? I mean, you know, it's part of the game. I always knew uh, at some point in time it was possible. Uh, But, you know, it's high stakes and it's out of the country. This would be my first time out of the country, period. So, uh, you know, I, I guess it's kind of fitting, you know. Interesting. So, I mean, you sort of alluded to this, but are are there any, you know, things that you have to do differently in terms of your preparation, knowing that you're going to be fighting overseas? No, uh, honestly, uh, I just want to show up and uh, be Raiz Salim. Uh, you know, there's always adversity, you know. Uh, and yeah, I just, I, I believe I'll, I'll adjust and do whatever I have to do. What can you tell us about your opponent, Sam Goodman? Uh, well, you know, he's, a, uh, he's an undefeated fighter. He's a very, very good boxer, uh, bounces on his feet a lot. Uh, he has a huge following out there. Uh, high boxing IQ, fast hands, fast feet. You know, I, I can't take anything away from the guy. You know, this is a huge fight and opportunity for both of us, and it's right in his backyard. Well, well speaking of his backyard, do you think that uh, it's an advantage for him fighting in his hometown, or is there more pressure on him because of that? Um, you know, there's probably a lot more uh, pressure on him. Uh, I believe all his fights have been in his hometown, you know, but... Uh, I, I think all the pressure's on him. You know, he, he's never fought a fighter like me. And, uh, you know, this is high stakes. So, uh, yeah. I was, I was looking at his record. He's fought some good fighters, but it seems to me this is a pretty significant step up in opposition for him. Does that sound right to you? Yeah, yeah, I, I think so. I mean, like, uh, I, I believe I am a world champion. You know, I just haven't had that fight yet. You know, uh, I, I, although I... I think he's a great fighter. I don't believe he's on Raiz Alim's level. You know, I I believe like my time is now and his is one day down the road. Okay. Uh, So the 122 pound division has been heating up. Uh, You've, as you said, you've established yourself as one of the elite guys in the division, but you haven't been able to land that big name yet. You know, what, why do you think that is? Honestly, uh, you know, a a lot of boxing politics kind of come into play, but, uh, High risk, low reward. The, the fact that I'm not a world champion right now, you know, anybody who steps in the ring with me, it's high risk with, you know, low reward. So this is the situation I want to put myself in with the IBF ordering this fight to happen. So the guys can't duck me, you know, like uh, once I beat this guy, I'm, I'm going after topless. Got it. So you you just went in the direction we were we were wondering about. Uh, has it been difficult being patient? I mean, you mentioned. I think you meant, just mentioned that now is your time. Is it difficult to kind of wait for your chance? You know, um, I ha- I haven't been waiting. I've been uh, you know, I've been chipping away at it. I've been pushing. I've been grinding, and uh, it's it's just the way it is. You know, everything's out of my con- control. You know, I can uh, only worry about the things I can control and. That's making weight, being in shape, being focused, and showing up. Now, uh, another fight uh, in your division, July 25th, Stephen Fulton and, and Naoya Inouye 
uh, will throw down. Can you give us your thoughts on that matchup? Uh, you know, th- that's going to be a great fight. Uh, you know, I do think in a way wins that fight. Uh, I can see them going the distance. I don't think he stops Fulton. But if 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 Stephen Fulton wins, he's a lot better than uh, than I give him credit for. You know, I think he's a great fighter. He's a solidified world champion. But I don't think he goes out there to Japan and beats the monster. What what in your opinion makes uh, you, Floyd so yeah, special? You, sorry, sorry, Ken, go ahead. Yeah, no, what makes you what what in your opinion makes uh, Inoue so special? Uh well, you know, we have to see if his power uh translates over to the uh 22 pound division, but I, I believe it will. You know, it's it's not just his power, but it's uh it's how fast he can close the gap. His uh his accuracy, his timing, you know, it's all at a uh elite level. It's all, you know, it's like 10, 10, 10. You know, uh, Fulton, he'll go out there, he'll try to box. But like with Roman, Fulton was able to, uh, he was like two, three steps ahead. Roman couldn't close the gap. You know, anytime Fulton tries to step or pivot or turn, Inouye is going to be right there and probably catching him with a big shot. You know, so he's uh, just a, a, a great fighter, explosive. You, you mentioned the way, and I'm just curious to get your thoughts on this. So he started several divisions lower than he is now. You don't think size might, might be a factor in that fight? Well, you know, it, it could be. Uh, Fulton has a big body. You know, he, he did fight Figueroa, and I, I thought that he lost that fight, but, you know, he got the win, and uh, Figueroa has to overwhelm you. You know, he puts his body on yours, make you fight in awkward positions, but uh, Fulton, he, he he's a pretty big fighter, uh, probably moving up to 26 soon, and he has the reach, He's just not a uh, he's not a strong puncher, right. you know. But uh, it's, it's going to be a good fight. He does have advantages going into this fight, and if he wins, he's better than what I give him credit for. But I I don't I don't I just don't see that happening. Gotcha. So Fulton has been a bit dismissive of you, of you whenever you're brought up. What, what's your take on that? Well, you know, at the end of the day, he's the champ, and uh, you know, high risk, low reward. You know. He, He'll fight me if he has to, you know, uh, if the WBO uh, orders that fight, otherwise vacate. But, you know, it just kind of is what it is. And, and until I earn uh, a world title, you know, people might be dismissive. People aren't going to want to fight me. And that's just, it is what it is. So you mentioned that if, assuming you win this fight, that the doors are going to open up now because your potential opponents will have no choice. Um, are you targeting anybody or any? fighters in particular that you want well you know uh I, I want topless you know after i beat this guy you know i want the uh the ibf world champion you know i know he wants the winner of uh in a way fulton but uh you know i, I want to uh fight topless before that even happens what do you think the chances of uh, of you uh sort of cutting him off before he gets that uh unification it's it's possible, you know. I I'd say uh, sixty forty. You know, forty uh, percent chance that it happens, sixty percent chance that it doesn't, because it's boxing. You know, you you don't know until you know. Yeah. But uh, I'll be ready for it. So we'll see. We're you know, I'm definitely gonna be pushing that. And if if that fight doesn't come, then you know, I might be looking at twenty six to see what opportunities I have up there. Or I might look at eighteen and see what opportunities are there. Any which way, Ray Salim is chasing the world title. You know, it's interesting you brought up 126 because, and we were talking about Fulton because you're you're a pretty big, strong dude for the division uh, as well. Are you still able to make that weight comfortably? I mean, I, I can make the weight. I wouldn't necessarily say uh, comfortably. You know, uh, I want to move up to 130. You know, a dream fight of mine is uh, fighting uh, Navarrete. Wow. Um, you know, but. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I don't see myself at the twenty-two pound division forever. I, I do see twenty-six and thirty in the in the near future. But I have to win the world title, defend it, and then once I do that, then I can explore those other options. Gotcha. So, last question: Give us your prediction for June seventeenth. How does it go down? <laughs> well, June seventeenth, uh, a Aleem comes out looking explosive. Uh, I plan on putting a few explanation points on this victory. Uh, outshining my last performance. And I believe the knockout will come.
It's just the only question is, does it come in the first half, the middle, or the end? I like it. Raiz, thank you so much for taking the, uh, the time out to speak to us. Wish you the best uh, for June 17th and, and look forward to having you back on again. All right. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks, Raiz. It's time for Mike and I to go toe to toe. This week, we're going to take a look at the 2023 International Boxing Hall of Fame inductees. It is the Hall of Fame weekend from June 8th to June 11th in Canastota. Of course, lots of legends will be out and we have the new inductees, some great names here. So we'll be going in alphabetical order, starting with two division champion, Timothy Desert Storm Bradley. Mike, what makes Tim Bradley a Hall of Famer? Well, going back and looking at Bradley's record was an eye opener for me. It reminded me about what he accomplished. Consider this. He beat in succession Miguel Vasquez, Junior Witter, Edner Cherry, Kendall Holt, Lamont Peterson, Luis Abregu, Devin Alexander, Yoel Casamayor, Manny Pacquiao, Ruslan Provodikov, and Juan Manuel Marquez. Now, I don't even think that kind of run is even possible today because guys generally don't fight one top guy after another like that. Uh, the only guy who really had Bradley's number was Pacquiao, who most people thought deserved all three, uh, the decision in all three of their fights. Uh, there's no shame, you know, not being quite as good as an all-time great like Pacquiao, but Bradley was better than almost every, everyone else. Uh, maybe these days you sort of forget how good he was. He was a really good fighter. Yeah, he really was. I remember first, what well, the first time I saw him was when he was on Showbox, uh, when he was a prospect, and I believe he was fighting someone called Manuel Garnica. I had no idea who Bradley was or Garnica, but, you know, um, of course, I uh, tuned into Showbox to see what, what the next generation was bringing, and Bradley really stood out. He landed a right hand on Garnica. I must have been thrown from like six inches away that drove him across the ring, you know, on, on, the, on the mat. And just watching him that night, I was like, crap, this guy is really good. He won me a lot of money when he won the title against Junior Witter. I, I think a lot of people didn't know him. And sure. at that time, uh, you know, Witter was really hot. Yeah, he was. But, uh, yeah, I just remember thinking, like, I, I, there's no way he's beating Timothy Bradley. Uh, and, and a lot of people didn't know Bradley at that time, but I remembered him from that Garnica fight. And, um, you know, he truly stood out. What was your favorite uh, memory of Bradley? I, th I think the Provodnikov fight. You know, he was so taken aback by the criticism that followed his victory over Pacquiao uh, that he said with his actions, you know, I'll show you. Uh, so he fought a prime uh, Provodnikov toe to toe, which from a tactical standpoint was was not the best idea. Uh, but it proved that Bradley was more than you know just a superb, really smart boxer, which is what he was. He was also an absolute warrior on top of everything else. So the only thing he really couldn't do was he didn't have a, a lot of ton of power. Maybe he was an average puncher at best, but um, he, he was really one of those guys who just didn't have a serious weakness. Yeah, yeah, well, just one excellent boxer had the heart had the grit uh truly great fighter so w well deserving let's go on to the next one a long time super middleweight champion and one of my personal favorites the cobra carl frotch might give us your your thoughts on mr frotch yeah he's one of my favorites too i almost feel a little bit biased in saying what i'm about to say but uh this is genuinely how i feel about frotch as a fighter um, you know, he had a run like Bradley's, you know, among the guys that he beat, you know, over a several year span was uh, Robin Reed, John Pascal, Jermaine Taylor, Andre Durrell, Arthur Abraham, Glenn Johnson, Lucian Butte, Yusef Mack, Mikkel Kessler, and George Groves twice. Uh, that included reaching the final of the Super Six tournament, you know, which he lost to uh, Andre Ward in the last fight. You know, Ward is the only opponent Frotch never beat. You know, his victory over Kessler avenged an earlier loss to uh, to Kessler. Uh, Frotch wasn't great in any aspect of boxing, but he was really good at everything. You know, that that combined with just a nasty streak and this, this unwavering co confidence in himself produced a really, really special fighter. He was, again, he was one of my favorites of the era. Yeah, and not to mention power in both fists and, and a, a great chin uh, to go along with all those other attributes. Uh, I was a big, big fan of Carl Frotch. I remember first time I saw him or met him uh, was at the press conference, the final press conference prior to his fight versus Jermaine Taylor. I think that was the first time he had uh, fought in the U.S. and I had no idea who he was and uh, didn't expect, didn't think that highly of him. I expected, you know, Taylor to do his thing, but I just remember how emphatic he was at the final presser and just how intense he was. 
and and you know talk about how he was he was uh, going to knock Taylor out, and sure enough, he did in a classic, classic performance. And you know, aside from being a great fighter, he was one of the great trash talkers uh, of our era too. I, I think the stuff between him and George Groves was just just legendary. Call fronts, and and also no shame in in losing to Andre Ward. Uh, of all fighters, it's like Azuma Nelson losing to Salvador Sanchez. Um, right. Not quite analogous, but you, you, you get what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, absolutely, Carl Frotch, one of my favorites, and glad to see him. What was your favorite memory of Carl Frotch? Well, first, I wanted to just sort of add on to what you had just said um, in terms of his intensity. I ran into him in Vegas, and we were just chatting. And I and I just told him flat out, I said, when I first saw you, I didn't, you know, was that not doing anything special kind of thing? I go, I didn't really know how good he was. I didn't think he was anything special. And he kind of gave me this look like, you better watch what you say, man. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and I'm like, well, this dude's really, really intense. I said, but hey, hey, but you won me over big time and you became one of my favorite fighters. And he's like, yeah. oh, okay, all right, everything's cool. Yeah, um, yeah. But but my awesome, memory, right. my memory of him, my main memory of him is it couldn't be more obvious. You know, the first thing I think of when I think of Frotch, when I hear Frotch's name, is his mic drop retirement. You know, the one punch yeah. knockout of of uh, Groves in front of eighty thousand screaming fans at Wembley Stadium in London. Uh, that was just absolutely breathtaking. And nobody went out on a higher note. Like in the history of boxing, maybe there's guys who went out on an equal note, but nobody ever went on a higher note. That was a way to go out in boxing. Yeah, absolutely. I completely agree with you. That was incredible. The the knockout. So many people had written him off after that first uh, gross fight, which I thought was insane um, because I thought I thought the stoppage was actually fair in that first fight. But the way he ended it in the second was just beautiful. Epic. It was, you know, vintage call frocks. And then to, yeah, drop the mic and walk away after that. Perfect. Good. Good on him. I mean, great way for him to go out. Um Back to the the next person on the list who I know is one of your personal favorites, a two division champion, uh, Rafael Marquez. Tell me why he is being inducted. Well, it must be tough to be the second best fighter in your own family. Uh, <laughs> but but Rafael Marquez did all right for himself. Uh, Rafael wasn't as skillful as Juan Manuel. You know who was? Not many people were. Uh, but he was a bigger puncher than Juan Manuel, and arguably it was more fun to watch, at least for a lot of uh, Juan Manuel's career. He actually got more fun to watch later on. Um, Rafael showed how good he was in two fights, in my opinion, you know, back-to-back victories over fellow Hall of Famer Mark Johnson, who I just had a ton of respect for. Uh, Marquez outpointed him, and then he stopped him. Um, and he might be best known for his just an absolute epic four-fight series with Israel Vasquez, you know, which gave Rafael the opportunity to demonstrate, you know, a combination of ability and fighting spirit that you just rarely see in the sport. Um, I think Marquez's election to the hall is overdue, but I was really happy to learn that he's in. He was just an absolute little beast. And I have to ask, is there a better brother combination in the history of boxing than Juan Manuel and Rafael Marquez? Well, there's the Klitschko's. And then I think the Charlos mm-hmm. are on their way. Charlos are up are, there. Are, yeah, they're moving in that direction. But right now, I think you can argue that the Marquez is the, the greatest brother combination in the history of the sport. Yeah, right. You know, Rafael was beautiful to watch. It, it's great because he all sort of fought alike and fought like Ricardo Lopez, you know, being under the tutelage of Nacho Berstein. So, and that Good style call. is just amazing yeah. uh, to, to to watch. I mean, if, if you, you could hit guys, Rafael, though. Yeah, you could. And he was willing yeah. to engage, you know, yeah. I was I, I I think the standout performance for me, obviously, aside from that incredible four, those incredible four fights was uh, his win over Timmy Austin, who at that time was uh, considered a rising star and, and really an excellent fighter. And I just remember uh, Marquez putting his lights out, you know, an impressive win. And obviously his brother went on to do great things as well. They both did. What was your favorite Marquez memory? Well, when I gave it some thought, I decided for me, it's the first three fights in his series with Israel Vasquez. You know, those fights are every bit as wild as Gotti Ward and Barrera Morales, or at least close to those. Uh, and the skill level was higher than Gotti and Ward, you know, which which for me really adds to the drama. Those fights were absolutely freaking insane. If you haven't seen them, you need to go back and do so. You'll thank me. Those fights were among my best memories as a fan. They were just insane. Yeah, I mean, it's among among the best in history, no question. Um, so I, I'm I'm very very glad to see him again in in the uh, Hall of Fame. Now we have some other folks in in the Hall of Fame as well, non boxers, some trainers. One in particular, uh, one of the great trainers and and most colorful personalities in modern boxing, uh, Joe Goose. And Mike, I know you have plenty to say about Joe, so let's uh, let's kick that off with him. Yeah, I could probably literally write a book. Um, 
you know, I've been friends with Joe for more than 30 years. So his induction into the Hall of of fame is sort of personal for me. Uh, and I've, as I've said on the podcast, uh, I cut my teeth in boxing when Gabriel and Rafael Ruelas were just becoming contenders in the early late 80s and early 90s. I really came along in the early 90s. Uh, and Joe was their trainer. You know, we were all from the San Fernando Valley area of LA, which is how all that happened. So I spent a lot of time with those guys. Uh, I got to appreciate not only Joe's technical knowledge of boxing, which is obviously uh, elite, uh, but also his ability to connect with his fighters, which I think was the secret or has been the secret to his success. You know, he was knowledgeable. He was a hard worker. He's passionate. He was really caring. And he still is, you know, even after all these years, nothing's really yeah. changed with Joe. And one more thing, it was just always fun to be around Joe, uh, fun to be around Dan Goose and Tom Brown and the rest of that wonderful Goose and family. Uh, I feel fortunate to have been in the right place at the right time. Uh, I couldn't. I really couldn't be happier for Joe. Uh, to say he deserves this is an understatement. Now there is yeah. one sad thing. I'm sorry that Dan isn't around to see it, uh, but he'll be there. He'll be there in spirit. So this is yeah. a real special, real special thing for the Goosens. Yeah, absolutely. It's just amazing to see Joe still going strong, still, uh, still, still elite. I mean, how many uh, boxing trainers from that era? Are, uh, remain one of the elite trainers in the game today. It's it's really really impressive impressive indicative of the kind of a uh, career he had. Uh, lots of others were in, inducted into the hall of uh, the hall of fame well, or are being inducted into the hall of fame this weekend. Mike, you, anything you want to share about them? Yeah, let me go through them real quick. So the the modern cat the, the three the three men that we mentioned were from the modern categories. There's also a women's modern category, and uh, the the two going in from the modern category are Alicia Ashley. Uh, I'm just going to give you a quick thought on each one. So the mo most remarkable thing about her, she became the oldest boxer to win a world title when she claimed a vacant belt at 48 years old, 2015. She didn't retire sh till she was 50 years old. So that a remarkable feat. Uh, Laura Serrano, uh, native of Mexico, she took on a huge challenge in her pro debut. She fought Christy Martin in her pro debut, uh, and she emerged with a disputed draw. You know, most people or a lot of people thought that Serrano deserved uh, that decision. Uh, anyway, she per persevered. She was just a natural boxer, and she went on to become one of the most accomplished female boxers uh, from her adopted home base of Las Vegas. Uh, Old-timer category, and I love the fact that we're able to, to mention these guys that are, that are long gone. Tiger Jack Box, he fought in the uh, from the late 20s to 1950. He had a record of 138, 24, and 12 with 91 knockouts. Think about that, 91 knockouts. That's like two entire careers for guys, just this number of knockouts. Uh, <laughs> Fox is one of those old timers who probably would have won multiple championships today. Uh, he was a, a one time light heavyweight champ, came from Spokane, Washington. He's a good boxer, but just had absolutely murderous power, which accounts for the 91 knockouts. He claimed victories over some of the biggest names in history, including Hall of Famers Maxi Rosenblum and future heavyweight champ Jersey Joe Walcott two times. He beat Walcott twice. Uh, and Walcott's obviously the guy that people would remember, but Tiger Jack Fox was. Uh, was something special. Pone Kingpetch, uh, tie fighter, fought in the mid mid 50s to the mid 60s. Tw only 28 and seven with nine knockouts. He made the most out of rel relatively few fights. He sort of sealed his fate as an icon in his country in only two bouts. He back to back victories over an all time great Pascual Perez uh, of Argentina in 1960. He took Perez's flyweight title by a split decision and then stopped him in eight in the rematch. Uh, and he went on to have two more reigns as a 112 pound champion. Absolute hero in his home country in Thailand. Glad to see he's recognized. And the last one's uh, uh, the third, a third woman, uh, Joanne Hagen. Now she only had a record of one and one. Uh, she fought once in 1954 and once in 56, but she's being inducted I guess for two reasons. One, she beat Barbara Buttrick, who's considered one of the women's boxing pioneers. She was inducted in the first class, I believe, uh, of women. But the second thing was, is, is she ended up, I guess she was a curiosity in a way, because she ended up being on TV a lot. Like she would go on to the talk shows and they were talk shows, like wow. a, being a woman boxer or something. So she sort of brought that to the masses, like that women can box. So she was a pioneer in that regard. Mm. Uh, anyway, great class, uh, great stuff. I love the Hall of Fame. All these people are very well deserving. Oh, absolutely. I mean, great names. Should be a fun weekend in Canastota and in Minnesota on June 24th. That's when our next guest is returning. He is the WBC interim 160-pound champ and will take on former unified champ Julian Williams in a PBC main event on Showtime, Carlos Adamas. Carlos, first things first, how has training camp been for this fight? 
Muy bueno, muy bueno, muy interesante, mucho enfoque, eh, concentrado al 100%. Eh, muy bueno, así que este campamento me, me ha gustado bastante. This training camp has been really, really good. It has allowed me to be 100% focused and it's been really interesting too, uh, learning new tools. What, what tools have you been learning uh, in, in this camp? No, le he sacado mucho, le he sacado mucho. Eh, eh, me, mejores técnicas, uh, golpes variados, eh, muchas cosas. Le he sacado mucho, mucho, mucho provecho a mi campamento. Siempre en, en los campamentos trato de aprender cosas diferentes. I have not only improved my technique, but also uh, varied my arsenal. I, I have a wider range of, of punches that I'm going to be able to showcase on June 24th. And like I said, training camp was great. Everything that I could have wanted. This is your, your fourth fight at a middleweight. And you looked very explosive in your last fight against uh, Montiel. Do you feel more comfortable at, at, at this weight? Are you more, more settled in, stronger at 160? Y realmente sí, me siento como en la división, ya que no, uh, no batallo para hacer mi peso, no, no bajo mucho de peso, no, no sufro mucho el, el, el pesaje. Eh, me siento como también, estoy, me siento súper más fuerte, esa, eh, la pegada más explosiva, por eso se ve la, la explosividad, se ve la, la consistencia en los golpes, se ve el, el, el impacto de golpeo. Pienso que sí, eh, eh, voy a hacer 160 para rato y pienso que, que, que los 160 tienen un problema grande conmigo. I'm here to stay at 160, and I'll tell you what, the 160-pound division, uh, I'm a problem for this entire for this entire division, that's for sure. And you mentioned the explosiveness. I'm glad that you can see that because I do feel it. I do feel that the impact and the consistency of my punches is much better than when I was in the, in the previous division at 154. And not only that, but I also don't struggle to make weight like I did there. So to me, it's it's really like night and day, and I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna plan to stay here for a while. There might excuse me, there might be a connection between that and my next question. So your only loss came in 2019 against Patrick Teixeira, who's a really clever boxer. Uh, what did you learn from that setback? Aprendí mucho de esa pelea porque esta pelea me llevó a hacer lo que soy hoy en día. Me preguntarán cómo, y le diría porque me llevó a ser un, un peleador más disciplinado, me llevó a entender que no hay rivales flojos, me llevó a entender que eh, todos los rivales hay que prepararse al 100, hay que llegar con buena preparación, y me hizo entender también que eh, mi, mi esquina de, de trabajo no estaba haciendo su, su trabajo como era indicado, por eso cambiamos de, de, de esquina, y esa pelea eh, me llevó a ser lo que soy hoy en día, me, 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 me sirvió de experiencia para, para el futuro. That fight taught me so much and it made me the person that I am today. I'm thankful for that fight. And you may ask me why. Well, uh, I, it taught me to be disciplined because like you said, he, he's an, he was an astute fighter, right? So I had to learn that lesson the hard way. He also taught me that there are no easy, no easy or weak opponents. I, have, I had to take each and every, and every opponent seriously. And he also allowed me to see that the people in my corner, they weren't who I needed anymore, that they didn't fit uh, what, what my philosophy and my goals were. And it allowed me to change that and be, and be with the team that took me on the path that I am today. Is the, the, the fact that you changed your team, is that why you were off for about a year and a half after that fight? Eh, no, esa no fue la razón. La razón fue que eh, eh, Top Rank, no, 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 no sé por qué no me... No me daba pelea en ese momento. Eh, no sé cuáles eran los lo pensamientos. No, tenían un plan para mí. No sé, no funcionó porque al final eh, optaron por darme el relief. Eh, pienso que ellos no estaban preparados para, para lo que venía después. Y por eso fue el tiempo, eh, la larga, a, a, a tener otra pelea. Por eso no, también eh, hubo la transición con, con la compañía PBC. Eh, eh, pienso que se tardaron mucho ellos conmigo eh, en tema de, de, de negociaciones, de buscarme rivales. No, no se preocupaban por buscarme rivales, nada de eso, y por eso hicimos la transacción. No, that wasn't the problem. The problem was the top rank uh, was taking very long. It was taking its sweet time, uh, having, having me scheduled for fights. They, they didn't schedule me with, with opponents. They, they didn't seem to be able to 
take care of me like I needed to. And that was the reason for the for the delay. And then keep in mind that also after Top Rank finally gave me the release, it was a matter of joining PVC and joining the fold. And that's why it took so long. Now you you've since won, you've won four in a row. Since then you've come back with the with, with the a vengeance. What has these past four victories meant for you and, and your career? En el aspecto general, eh, lo que le acabo de eh, 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 decir ahorita, eh, mi, eh, esa pelea contra Patrick de Seira me enseñó muchas cosas. Y ahí está, y lo estoy demostrando con, con las rachas de victoria que estoy obteniendo después de esa pelea. Porque el trabajo, el, la dedicación, el enfoque en el gimnasio, el trabajo que ha hecho eh, en la técnica, en la superación de mi boxeo, eh, me ha ido ayudando, eh, los pies sobre la tierra, me ha ido ayudando, y eso es lo que ha cambiado bastante mi boxeo, y por eso... Eh, ven esta determinación que tiene el, el, el caballo bronco ahora pienso que va a haber caballo bronco para rato, dominicano dominicano, muy orgulloso de ser dominicano y pienso que eh, ahora mismo de los, los 160 el más temido de los 160 tienen un gran problema conmigo que no, que no se van a deshacer de él por rato It's all about uh, the, the, the winning streak is all about the bronco that that you know now, like I mentioned before, that Patrick the Sheriff fight was uh, before and after in my life. It parted the waters. It taught me how to be how to be more dedicated, more disciplined in the gym, and more varied in my technique. It truly opened my eyes. And if I have a problem for the 160 pound division now, it's because of all the work that I put in uh, since then. And trust me, the the Bronco is ready to gallop. The 160 pound division better be ready because I'm going to cause all sorts of havoc and I'm here to stay. It's going to be, it's going to be really fun to see what, what sort of chaos and, and, you know, I'm looking for the word here. Okay. Well, what sort of chaos I'm going to, I'm going to create in this division. Now, Julian Williams, who you're facing on June 24th, it's a, he's a dangerous opponent. Why would you take such a dangerous fight when you're so close to that world title shot. Eh, como te puedo decir, eh, yo no elijo mis oponentes. Yo solamente soy un guerrero. Yo soy un soldado eh, que voy a mi batalla, voy a mi guerra. Mi compañía, mi promotora se enfoca de buscarme mis rivales eh, y yo pienso que ellos tienen un plan, un plan conmigo eh, de, de lograr grandes nombres. Por eso elegimos a Julian Williams. O sea, nosotros no somos eh, presa fácil de nadie. O sea, él, yo sé que tampoco él es una presa fácil de nadie. Por eso nosotros, eh, yo siempre le he seguido a mi, a mi compañía que me ponga lo, 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 los retos mayores que ellos tengan, porque a mí me gustan los grandes retos. Eso me hace eh, da, de, darme cuenta en qué pie estoy parado y qué voy a hacer en el futuro, si voy a, a dudar mucho en esto o no. No, yeah, it's about it's about going after the biggest challenge. I always tell my promoter, my company, uh, give me give me the toughest challenges because that's the only way I can find out if I'm here for the long run or not. And, and that's what I wanna, that's what I wanna do. I wanna, I wanna prove myself and I wanna, I wanna see, I wanna see what, I'm, what I've got. In the end, I'm not the one that chooses the fights. I'm a warrior, I'm a soldier. And if, if uh, my promoter, the company that I, that I have decides that I have to have a tough opponent, go ahead, put him in front of me. I'm not scared of anybody. Love it. Uh, Williams has shown special ability in the past. What makes him a significant challenge? Ah, lo que lo hace interesante es que, como puede ver, él fue un, un buen peleador, pero a ver, una mandíbula débil contra un pegador, el pegador más fuerte de los 160. Eso es algo como, como, como interesante, como que hay que verlo porque a ver qué hace una mandíbula débil con un, peli, con un pegador peligroso, o sea, Para mí, eh, la, los retos están ahí. Yo, por eso te digo, siempre estoy dispuesto a aceptarlo y pienso que esa pelea va a ser bastante interesante porque todos quieren ver qué va a pasar una, mandiva, una mandíbula débil con un peleador, con un pegador. O sea, y es bueno e interesante ver eso. You call him interesting? I, I call him a weak chin, really. And it's going to be really interesting to see what a weak chin like his does against a powerful puncher like me. That's going to be an explosive combination. And, and to me, I'm really intrigued uh, to see how he reacts when, when that kind of uh, explosion happens inside the ring. 
That's an interesting concept. Um, this is more or less a do or die fight for Williams, I think. Uh, he's had some ups and downs. I don't think he can afford another loss. Uh, do you expect to face a particularly hungry guy? Pienso que, eh, como puede ver, ya es un, un oponente que va, va, va en decadencia. Esto es una no es una oportunidad. Eh, para mí, es un, un reto más. Para él, es una oportunidad más. Eh, pienso que él tiene que hacer el sacrificio, tiene que dar, tiene que brindar algo, algo, algo que para que digan, para que se pueda, se, se pueda imaginar que pueda ganarme a mí, tiene que venir con algo diferente. Si viene con lo, lo, lo típico de Julian Williams, no creo que vaya a durar ni siquiera un round. O sea, pienso que eh, la pelea va a ser bastante interesante, hay, hay, hay que verla y, y creo que no lo subestimos para nada a él, no lo subestimos, por eso llevo mis condiciones al máximo y no dar lo mejor de mí. I'm not about to underestimate him. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give my best first of all. And I know that just like uh, Julian Williams is this as another opportunity for him, I see it as another challenge for me as well. Uh, and I would say that if Julian Williams plans to come, uh, come out with the same old Julian Williams recipe then I don't think that he even lasts around against me. If he plans to beat me, if he plans to be competitive against me, then he has to uh, bring something else to the, to, to the ring. Otherwise, he's going to be in serious trouble. Are you looking to outperform uh, Jamal Charlo, who knocked out Julian Williams in five rounds? Are you looking to do something more dramatic than what he did? Bueno, eh, eh, ¿qué te digo? Si, si, eh, a mí no me gusta pronunciar nada de, de, de mis peleas porque eh, no sé cómo va, eh, Dios trae ese día para nosotros. Son, son días diferentes, eh, son preparaciones diferentes, son condiciones diferentes. Eh, lo que Dios me tenga preparado para mí esa noche, estoy dispuesto a trabajar. Lo que sí voy con el enfoque es de ganar mi pelea, de dar un buen espectáculo esa noche, de, de demostrar que hay un, un campeón en la 160 eh, sólido, un campeón que hay que temer, un campeón que, que está proyectado para cosas grandes. Eh, que sea lo que Dios, lo que Dios nos pronostique para esa noche, así será. Si, si llega el knockout, de seguro que lo vamos a aceptar y bienvenido. I want to be seen as a, as a feared fighter, as a champion, as a champion that, that's at the top and that, that, really, uh, that really people don't want to come anywhere near because, because I'm so feared. And, and that starts here. I want to put on a show. I want to, I, I want, to win the fight, but at the same time, I'm not going to give any predictions. I don't like that because it's in the hands of God and you never know how you wake up that day. And each of us may wake up differently and, and there are no guarantees in this sport. So I put it, I put it in the hands of God. He, uh, God knows what he's doing. And if he provides me with the chance to knock Williams out, then I'll welcome that. And if not, I'll just give my best throughout the fight. Well, what does a victory over Williams mean for you in your career? Es un paso más del escalón. Es un paso más del escalón. Eh, una victoria sobre Julian Williams. Un paso más de mi escalón. Estoy más cerca de, de lograr más mi objetivo. De más cerca de, de, de los nombres grandes que, que sé que vienen ahí al detrás. Y por ahora solamente estoy enfocado en Julian Williams. Pienso que ese escalón tengo que subirlo y con Dios y la fe y la, la disciplina y el trabajo que ha hecho en mi gimnasio, pienso que lo voy a lograr. I think that you can skip steps and that I am going to be able to, to climb step by step, just like Julian Williams is one more step towards my ultimate goal. I have to go easy, step by step, not looking, not looking that far forward because I know that the mix of my skill, my hard work and what I do in the gym is going to take me to where I want to be. So you're the you're the WBC's interim title holder below only Jamal Charlo. Uh, you've called out Charlo. You even called him a coward. Uh, is that just your way of trying to get him to to fight you? No es una manera de, no es una manera de amedrentarlo. Es la verdad. Es un cobarde porque no no o sea él sabe que tiene un compromiso. Lo que pasa es que él ha legado su vida personal con el compromiso. O sea esto es boxeo. Yo yo he sufrido. Yo he sufrido con mis compromisos familiares. Yo he sufrido con mis compromisos que he tenido pérdida grande. Yo he sufrido y aquí estoy. 
luchando por mi objetivo. O sea, esto es un objetivo, esto, esto, esto es un compromiso no solamente de él, de fanáticos, de compañía que necesitan ver actividad y él no se la está brindando. Entonces, ¿qué es lo que le espera? Eh, ah, que después que se ponga más viejito, ah, me ganaron porque soy viejito. No, aprovechar el momento ahora que es joven. Para mí, no es, es tratando de amedrentarlo, es un cobarde. I, I'm not trying to provoke him or try to, to go him into fighting me. That's just the truth. He's a coward. He's mixing his personal life with uh, his duty to, uh, to work and perform. Look at me. I, have, I also had to overcome adversity. I also had really, really great family issues that I had to attend. But I, but I also was always at the gym, always ready to fight, always ready to do my job. And, and what's Charlo doing? Uh, taking time off so that eventually he can say, Oh, I wasn't in my prime. I was too old. That's why he beat me. Is that what he's gonna do? Because I don't think that's I don't think that's right. In the end, that makes him a coward. Gotcha. Um, so there's talk that he may end up moving up to super middleweight. Who knows? Uh, would that be disappointing for you, or do you just want to fight for the title? And it really doesn't matter who it is. Realmente sí. Realmente puede ser eh, puede llegar a ser decepcionante para mí porque. O sea, yo, no, yo, yo, yo quiero enfrentarme a él. O sea, yo no, yo no, yo no quiero que él suba a, la de, a, la, a los 128. Yo quiero que él demuestre con guantes en la mano que sí era un campeón. Que no fue algo que, uh, uh, que llegó el momento y te dieron la oportunidad y te, y, y te pusieron una faja en la mano. Después te dura tres años, no pelea y dice, yo soy campeón. No, yo quiero que él demuestre que es un campeón. Y yo me gustaría que él se quedara en la 160 y me demostrara a mí Con, con palabras, no solamente a mí, a todos los fanáticos que esperan ver ese momento, demostrar que sí, que, que, que él es un campeón. It will be disappointing. Show, not, don't you show me. Show the fans why you're a true champion. You can't just wear the belt once and then be able for three years and be like, oh yeah, I'm still the champion. No, you have to go in there, put, lace up your gloves, and show and show me what you're worth. That's that's the that's the challenge that he should be able to accept. And I don't know why he isn't, but I don't want any more excuses. I want him in front of me, and I want the 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 biggest challenge possible in order for him to prove that he's up to the task as well. So if if that doesn't happen, are, are there other potential opponents that you're excited about facing? Claro, me gustaría, uh, ahí está Alin Canuli, campeón en la 160, eh, luego Rinaldi Laras y, y, y Dani García, Cam cualquiera de los dos que ganen, campeones de los 160, también me gustaría enfrentar cualquiera de los dos. Eh, Triple G, me gustaría también enfrentarlo, si va a pelear o no va a pelear, también me gustaría enfrentarlo. O sea, eh, los nombres que hagan en 160, yo estoy dispuesto a, a enfrentarlo. Si se me da... La oportunidad de los 168, Caleplan, Benavide, David Morel, Canelo, Álvarez, o sea, yo la acepto, no hay problema, o sea, yo siempre estoy listo, como, te, como le dije ahorita, soy un guerrero y estoy listo siempre. Pero volvamos a, 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 el de Lara, después de Lara, ¿quién era? Can, eh, Lara y, y, y Dani García. Dani García, ahí está. Y el, y el primero, eh, ¿cómo se dice? Canuli. 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 Ok. Entonces, so. I, I, have a, I have a long list of opponents that I want to face. Uh, let's say at 160, uh, Canuli, uh, you have Lara, you have uh, Danny Garcia. Uh, I would love to face Triple G as well. I, I, I respect him a lot. And then if I were to go up at 168, you have the cream of the crop there too. Canelo, Benavides, Caleb Plant. Uh, options abound, that's for sure. Absolutely. So the, the last question comes from Ken. My podcast partner loves good food, as do I. Uh, he wants to know where to get good Dominican food in New York City. Porque tú no puedes ir a Estados Unidos a comerte un platillo dominicano. Tienes que ir a la República Dominicana a comerte un platillo dominicano. O sea, ahí sí te va a probar un platillo, un platillo dominicano real. ¿Qué quiere probar? Lo que quiera probar en República Dominicana, ya lo va a encontrar. Y no, o sea, 
y no creo que va a ser una decepción. Totalmente va a ser algo que inolvidable. Pienso que se va a querer quedar en República Dominicana. Uh, Michael, don't just go down the street and, and try and try Dominican food because that's going to be disappointing. No, you want Dominican food? You got to go to the DR yourself and I promise you, you that you won't want to leave. You're yeah. going to be so in awe that that you're not gonna wanna that you're not gonna wanna leave and you're gonna wanna stay and you'll be like New York what? So so yeah, no, if you want Dominican food, trust me. Go to go to the DR and go for the real thing. And then yeah. it's gonna blow you away. You're not gonna be the same. That's the plan. I have friends who go to the <clears throat> that go to the Dominican Republic regularly. They love the place. So uh, I just want to go there anyway. So the food would be a bonus. De la comida y que la comida también va a ser un bonus, así que tiene pensado pasar oh, por ser, será, será bienvenido. Eh, le invito que, que pase por allá, por la, ciudad, la zona turística de República Dominicana, Punta Cana, una de las zonas más exclusivas en, en, en turismo, una belleza, la playa. O sea, tenemos varias playas vírgenes, tenemos playas con agua turquesa, tenemos, o sea, en República Dominicana no hay nada, no tiene nada que envidiarle a otro país. Eh, Buenas comidas, eh, diversión. Pienso que allá se va a pasar un buen momento. I, I can guarantee that when you do go, uh, you're going to have a great time. You have the crystal clear water. You have the food. You have the, the some, some Virgin Islands over there that are beautiful. So I highly recommend that you go. And I, and I invite you personally to Punta Cana. And that's where you're going to have a blast. I'm, I'm convinced. Okay, Carlos, um, I love your passion. I love your confidence. I'm more excited about your career now than I was before. So I really look forward to seeing what happens with you. Thanks so much for joining us. Okay, thank you. Okay, gracias. That's going to do it for this week's show. We want to thank Carlos Adamas and Raiz Aline for joining us. And of course, we want to thank you guys for tuning in. Be sure to check us out next week for more boxing talk, more interviews right here on the PBC Podcast.